the Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. At exactly 45 I start. Yes. Good afternoon, dear students, and welcome to this uh, first session of your distance learning revision program. In, run by the ministry in Yaoundé. We are in philosophy. The, uh, my name is Celestine Chem, and of course, you know, I am a philosophy teacher. The topic we are going to be focusing on today is the Sophists and Socrates. The Sophists and Socrates. But before that, of course, we are going to have to run through a bit of a revision. And the subtopics we are having will be the Sophists. Next, Socrates. Next, evaluation exercises. Of course, before we delve into the uh, heart of the matter today, we are going to take a small rundown of the previous lessons, treating or dwelling on the pre-Socratics. The pre-Socratics had, they were very different kind of people who initiated what we call science and philosophy. And their nature of inquiry was that they transited from myth to reason. They are the people who engaged into the kind of questioning that required rational answers, that required argued demonstrations, and they were dissatisfied with mythological answers given to questions concerning the universe, uh, we call them cosmological questions, in general. One of the aspects that pushed them into this kind of special inquiry is what the Greeks called the Thaumaxein. The Thaumaxein is what is translated into English as wonder or curiosity and it is a kind of curiosity that gets dissatisfied with what people take for granted. What people accept already, the kind of curiosity called Thaumaxein is going to question it, bring it to question and try to find out why is it so. Why it is that people are satisfied with things for which they should not be uh, satisfied. And so philosophy, philosophy and science in general originates at a time when people begin to question what is ordinarily taken for granted. What everybody accepts as being normal, philosoph philosophers question it. What period did they come in? The pre-Socratics existed at about 600 to 500 years before Christ was born. And they share a community of thought. They share a method of thinking, a method of inquiry, a method of investigation that is characteristic of science and philosophy. What kind of method is it? It is the method that seeks 
or that inquires into the causes and principles of all things that exist. And why are they? The question is pertinent because at that time, there were many more people, many more people existed at that time. But these people whom philosophy has retained as pre-Socratics are special. How special were they? Their specialty resides in the fact that they raise questions whose answers are established upon argument and evidence. Argument and evidence. We know that if, for instance, we ask you a question, who created the universe? It's straightforward, it's God. Why? Religion cannot answer that. But philosophers would want to ask, why? Where does the universe come from? Why did it have to exist at all? And asking questions this way that required uh, uh, argumentation and evidence, they then initiated what we call empirical science and philosophy. They distinguished themselves by that kind of inquiry into uh, the initiators of philosophy and science. These uh, pre-Socratics, uh, we group them into certain themes. We're not going to take a historical narrative of them. We are grouping them according to the themes they treated and according to uh, the, their community of thought. The first theme we are going to look with, to see with the pre-Socratics is the theme of the one and the many. The universe, there are many things in the universe. Is this universe composed of one thing or of many things? If one, what is it? And how this, does it account for the many things that are found in the universe? And so the first problem, the first problem we are trying to solve will be what accounts for the origin and diversity of the universe? The solutions are many and the theses are also many depending on which pre-Socratic we are treating and depending on what epoch we are dealing with. So the first solution will be what we can call the materialist modest solutions. Materialist means that from, we, we, we draw inspiration from Aristotle. These uh, pre-Socratics are those who postulated that the originating principle of the universe is a material substance and the material substance is not many, but one. Monist is from the Greek monos, which means one. So these are materialists who think that the originating principle of the universe is one substance. The first of these people naturally is Thales, who says that the arche, meaning the originating principle of all, uh, of, of the entire universe, that from which things originate, that which goes into the constitution of all things in the universe, and that which sustains things in their, in their being in the universe is water. And of course, uh, the second uh, thesis is Anaximenes, who says that the originating principle of the universe is air. It is air that, is, uh, that accounts for the origin of things in the universe, their existence, their maintenance in existence, and of course, all things are going to perish again in air. The difference between Thales and Anaximenes is that while Thales did not produce an elaborate process of the originating, the origination of things in the universe, Anaximenes brought two principles, rarefaction and the densification of air. This revision, we have, uh, your teachers have done that in class. We are going to go faster than that. But what we should take into consideration is that the key philosophical insight of Anaximenes is that differences in the quantity of air account for the differences in the origination of the different things we find in the universe. The second set of solutions which we are seeing uh, what we call the metaphysical and monist solutions. These are people who think that the originating principle is not a material substance, but rather a metaphysical substance. And that being metaphysical, it is also one. Hence, the appellation monism. And the first, the first of these is what we call, the philosopher we call Anaximander, for whom the originating principle, the RK, is the A, Peron, which is qualitatively indeterminate, it is boundless. In fact, it is not an it, because the word it already uh, 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 determines it and fixes it, but 
It is not a thing. In fact, it is a nothing. We see the language becomes limited to talk about these things already. So the apparent, being the originating principle of, of, of the universe, the process of origination is layered, structured. At the bottom, we see the apparent, things uh, separating off the apparent, the elements, the four elements, water, earth, air, and fire. They separate off, and in their mingling, brings about the different things that exist in the universe. The second metaphysical monist we look at is Pythagoras, who says that the arche, the originating principle of things in the universe, is number. Please, not numbers. Number. Number. Number is a metaphysical concept. We see numerals. One, two, three, four. These are numerals. They can be written in Arabic, they can be written in the Roman, they can be written in all kinds of uh, ways. And these are representations of discrete quantities whose conception is reducible to number. So Pythagoras says that all things in the universe originate from number. And of course, if I were to take your weight, it will be in figures. If I were to measure your height, if I were to count your, your, your age, etc., all of these go into uh, the solution. If I were to measure the amount of substance in a, chem in a chemical, we can count the number of atoms, etc., etc. So it is plausible to say that things originate from number. Now, the next set of solutions is the metaphysical pluralist solutions. These people think that the originating principle is not material, yes. It is metaphysical, yes. But at the same time, it is not one, it is many. And the first of them, of course, is Empedocles. And the one we study on our program is Empedocles, who thinks that there are two basic conflicting principles in the universe which organize, originate, and organize things in the universe. They are Philotes and Nekos. Philotes is what is translated as love, and Nekos is what is translated as strife such that different com combinations of these, the perpetual confliction of them, when Philotes is in vogue, when Philotes takes the pride of place or is dominating, then we have generation and the construction and peace in the universe. But when Nacos hate or strife, when it takes over, then we have destruction and wars and all kinds of things in the universe. We might think of it as the alternation of day and night. Of course, when it is day, it is bright. Everybody goes around their business. When it is night, people go back to sleep and prepare for the next day. The second theme which we studied with the uh, pre-Socratics is the theme which we entitled the being enigma. An enigma is uh, an aporia. It is a conceptual difficulty, something that is difficult for us to grasp with our representative methods and ways of thinking. And the problem here is, what does it mean to be? We say, I am. We say, you are. It is. But what does it mean to be? And connected to that question is, what constitutes the beingness of the universe and anything in it? Is it permanent or is it change? Is it that the fact that things change all the time, is it what makes the being of the thing? Or it is because things are permanent that they, uh, that they are? Good. So the solutions which we are going to have for uh, the problem of the being enigma, whether there is permanence or change, the solutions are going to be provided by three philosophers. The first is Heraclitus, of course, who says that being is one, at variance with itself. What does it mean? It means that being is unity, but at the same time, it changes all the time. Remember the Heraclitian dictum, which says that well, you cannot step into the same waters twice. The river stays the same, but the waters in the river continue flowing. River Vuri remains River Vuri, but the waters that flow it change all the time. And so we think of it that way. Change flows all the time, but identity remains, but it is not the identity that determines the being of the thing. The second philosopher who brings a different kind of solution takes the point of view of permanence, and that is Parmenides. He says, by being, it is. What is, is insofar as the fact of being is permanently 
permanently exhibited by its different forms. Of course, we know that uh, the one is uh, it's permanent, it is fixed, it is oval, it is spherical. There are no indentations in it for fear of the uh, principle of non-contradiction. We have seen, boom, okay, that is Dora, there is Gloria, you're welcome on board. You can stop at any time and uh, we can answer your questions. If you have a question at any time, you can stop and we can answer you. You're welcome. The third solution is uh, Zeno, who, who says that change is paradoxical. We know that Zeno propounded a number of uh, paradoxes, more than 40 of them, but four of them are usually retained to, uh, uh, in support of his master, Parmenides, to show that change does not exist, that change is impossible. And of course, the logical structure of his argumentation is the uh, uh, modus tollens, all right? We take the Achilles paradox, for instance. It, it will go as thus. If there is change, then Achilles will overtake the tortoise. But Achilles does not uh, overtake the tortoise, so there's no change. And so, finally, being is permanent, fixed, spherical, unchanging. That is it. So, that, with that, we come to the end of our review of the pre-Socratics, a, a very fast rundown of the pre-Socratics. Our topic for today is the Sophist and Socrates, and we are going to go straight into them. The Sophists. Who is a Sophist? The tradition has given us a very negative connotation of the Sophist, but we are going to try to understand the concept of Sophist. And we know that there are two conflicting conceptions of the meaning of Sophist a positive and a pejorative conception. About the positive conception, we see that the sophists historically were contemporaries of Socrates. That is, they lived together in the same epoch, in the same place with Socrates. And they were itinerant professional teachers. Itinerant meaning that they went from place to place. They were teachers, they were ambassadors, they were traders. So in essence, they were people who always go from place to place, uh, bringing along with them several kinds of traditions. Now, sophist, the word sophist itself, in its Greek meaning, comes from a, a cluster of Greek words, sophistes, which is a noun, coming from another adjective, sophos. And sophos means skilled in an art, a wise person, a clever person. So a medical doctor who is very competent as a doctor is a sophos. In fact, a sophist in medicine, in the, uh, uh, in the positive conception of it. And the sophist did not constitute a school. They did not have a common theme and a common doctrine that they taught. In fact, they were rivals amongst themselves, and they were people who had different kinds of topics, treating different kinds of things at, uh, at different times. But we call them sophists together simply because, simply because they uh, have a common a common outlook, a common philosophical outlook, which is a deconstruction of the status quo, a, a critique of what people accepted as normally. So we cannot call them a school, we can only call them a movement. Now, what is the pejorative meaning of, so, of uh, sophist? We get the first of these pejorative meanings from Aristotle, who is uh, an enemy to the sophist, who says that a sophist is a man who makes a living from apparent but unreal wisdom. Basically, a sophist is somebody who pretends to be wise, who pretends to be intelligent, and on, not, does not only pretend, but also sells the pretense for money. For money. He is also an, an intellectual harlot. We know what harlots are. Prostitutes, they sell themselves and adopts a meretricious intellectual pose. Meretricious means that they uh, demand payment for what they are giving out to the people. What is important, what is very important here with this money palaver that is so, that, that uh, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle are so bitter about is that in Athenian society, things like virtue, we are going to see that later, the noble honesty, uh, kindness, these are virtues which were supposed to be learned in a family, amongst friends, transmitted, free of charge, for which there could only be gratitude. You teach a child honesty, the child only owes you gratitude. The child cannot be expected to pay you back. And so when it comes, when the sophists come, 
One, they sell, they pretend to teach virtue, which is learned, acquired passively. Secondly, they sell the teaching of virtue, which is already a, a, a taboo for a normal uh, Greek. And thirdly, they sell it to anybody, friend or foe. To, uh, no, for instance, in the Greek uh, society, if you go to Sparta, you, are going, you have to be courageous. And courage is taught within families. And somebody comes to teach them, the Spartans, to teach them courage, teach them how to fight in battle and expect payment for it. It is a cultural shock that the uh, uh, Greeks could not take. And that is why they are so bitter against the uh, sophists. And so, in English, therefore, we have a cluster of words which come from sophists. Sophism is fallacious reasoning. Sophistry is the technique of using fallacious arguments and a sophist, therefore, in English, according to the pejorative, according to the pejorative uh, uh, conception, is one who uses sophistry. Now, some sophists include Protagoras, Gorgias, Hippas, Prodicus, Antiphon, Thrasymachus, Callicles. We are going to look at Pro uh, Protagoras, Gorgias, and Thrasymachus. These are the three sophists whom we are going to uh, be looking at in our, uh, in our lesson. Now, the first thing we are going to study with the, with the sophists is philosophy and concrete human existence. It's very important, very important here. We are saying that basically what the sophists and Socrates did was to inaugurate a paradigm shift, a different kind of questioning in philosophy. While the pre-Socratics, as we have seen, they were uh, engaged in metaphysical, cosmological questions, cosmogonic questions also, they did not care about questions of human existence in the society. It is the sophists and Socrates who bring philosophy down to the home, down to the streets, down to the common people, and begin to ask questions that concern people's lives in society. So there is a shift from the cosmological and metaphysical inquiry into inquiry about human existence in society. To say that in big, in philosophical terms, we say that it is a shift from cosmocentric to anthropocentric paradigm. So the pre-Socratics, as we have seen, they were concerned with metaphysical and cosmological, cosmogonic questions. So the problems which the, which the sophists and Socrates are posing in society are generally ethical problems and epistemological problems. The ethical problem is, for instance, are moral laws universal or relative? When we say that do not steal, is it everybody everywhere who thinks and accepts that stealing is bad or is it only for some people? We are going to see that kind of a question with the sophist called Protagoras. And the second kind of question connected to, to morals, it is politics but connected to morality, is the question of justice. What does justice consist in? Is it doing good all the time? Paying back your, what you, you borrow or what? We are going to look at that with Thrasymachus. And the second kind of question which the sophists and Socrates pose in general is epistemological. Questions concerning knowledge, the, the source and validation of knowledge. And we are going to look at it. Is truth or knowledge subjective or objective? What I know, is it only right or true according to me, or we can all accept that what I know is correct for everybody? One plus one equal to two. Is it correct only for me or for all of us? Protagoras is going to tell us something about that. And connected to that kind of a question is whether or not even knowledge exists. And if it exists, what does it consist in? And that is gorgeous. Is, it, is knowledge even possible? Can we even say that we know anything? And if we know anything, what does it consist in? We shall see that there is a, a, a question of language in there as we proceed. Now, and the third kind of epistemological problem is what method is acceptable in philosophy? We have seen that the sophists were queried for selling, for pretending to be wise, and for using any kind of method. What method did they use, and can they be philosophical or not? And the, there are three methods in philosophy as far as the Socrates, as far as the sophists and Socrates are concerned. We have the dialectic, we have the antilogic, and we have the heuristic. We shall see what they are as we proceed. Now, the first moral question 
the Protagorean thesis, relativism. What does Protagoras say? Let us listen to it. This is a fragment taken from Protagoras' work quoted by Diogenes Laesius. It reads, Of all things, the measure is man. Of things that are, that they are. Of things that are not, that they are not. What does it mean? We can take man to be the individual, we can take man to be a race, a community, etc. But the bottom line is that what a society accepts as good for it is good for that society and nobody can impose it on to anybody else anywhere at all. So if the society decides that this room, that this lesson exists, it exists. If another society decides that, the, that this lesson doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. People make laws, and we can see that the laws of Cameroon are not the same as the laws of Nigeria. They are different. And so we are beginning to see and to understand that man being the measure of all things says that things are true or false or exist according to the person perceiving, the person deciding, or the people perceiving, or the people deciding. Now, what is the theory behind that? What is let us try to see how Protagoras puts his argument. We break it down into premises. He says this, if X seems P to S, then X is P to or for S. We are drawing a lot from our logic. We know that S is the subject. We know that P is the predicate. And X is any situation. All right? For instance, if this pen is white, P for me, S, then it is white, not for you, for me. And so, if, all, if it is true for me and not true for you, then all propositions are going to be true. Because it is true for me. And you cannot verify. And you cannot refute it. And that truth is not contradictory because it is according to me and it is for me. If this room is hot for me, and cold for you, I don't feel your feeling. You don't feel my feeling. So it is hot for me and cold for you. And all of our propositions are true. And so each individual, or whatever we substitute for S, if we take S to be an individual, then we have subjectivism. If we take S to be a race, or a, then we shall have racial relativity. If we take S to be a state, then we can understand that the laws of Cameroon are different from the laws of Nigeria or the laws of America, etc. And for different values of P, the predicate, we can have perceptual, what you feel. We can have moral, the laws. We can have epistemological, what you know as truth. So if Cameroon, S, knows that homosexuality is bad, then it is correct and true for Cameroon. And if a state in America, S, knows that homosexuality, P, is good, then it is good for them. And Cameroon cannot impose and universalize their own position that homosexuality is bad. That is the theory. Any question? Somebody has a question there? Hello? We cannot get you, sir. We acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. Chang Innocent. Uh, maybe you have to connect your microphone better so we can get your question. So basically, that is Protagoras' theory and that is his uh, argument for it. Remember, in philosophy, nothing has been said unless the argument for it has been produced. Now we ask ourselves, is Protagoras' argument convincing or not? Are we convinced by it? Should we accept relativism? So we can object to it. By saying, and this is, the, and this is the, uh, the, the objection raised by both uh, Socrates and Plato, including Aristotle, against uh, 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 Protagoras. It is based on the principle of contradiction. He says that relativism is self-contradictory. Because, what does it mean? If you say that truth is relative, that anything can only be true according to me or according to you, then you must hold it as true, absolutely true, that truth is relative. If there is anything that can be absolutely true at all, 
then you are saying that your own theory of relativism is imposable upon me and you contradict yourself. So you are saying that the absolute truth is that truth is relative. So if something can be absolute, then there is no relativism at all. That is a very uh, kind of <laughs> argument that, that sounds very intellectually uh, challenging. I'll take it over again. The self-contradiction in, in relativism is this. Whoever says that truth is relative must have it as absolutely true that truth is relative. From the moment they have anything as absolutely true, it means that they have contradicted themselves by saying that truth is relative. Truth cannot be relative and be absolutely true at the same time. That is the contradiction in it. Good. So, if we were relativists, how do we respond to this kind of uh, a, a, a challenge. How do we respond to this kind of a, a, an objection? Remember that in the methodology of our philosophical essays, what we call here during our lessons, the objections are the possible antithesis. And the response to the objection is going to constitute the synthesis. Now, being a relativist, we want to show that relativism is convincing. So we have to respond to the objection raised against us. And how does it run like? Whatever is absolute is still self-referential. It's very important. Things do not fall from heaven. Somebody starts something somewhere and people finally accept it and then accept it to be universally true. Patent example. Without Newton, we would not have had the laws of Newton in physics till today. Newton started alone, though he got some uh, influences from Copernicus, from Kepler, etc. But, but without him, we wouldn't have had the laws of Newton. And it is because of him that such laws became universalizable and they are now objective. So, basically, basically, the relativistic claim remains patent and plausible because whatever becomes generalized or objective, or a universal begins by either an individual or a group of people who bring up theories. It is very clean and understandable and seeable in, in the sciences. So that uh, brings to a close our rapid uh, revision on Protagoras. I don't know if there's a question anywhere there. If you have a question, you can indicate and ask your question and ask it, and we shall be able to clarify any doubt. Or if we are too fast, you could always indicate so that we can be able to slow down the tempo. The second uh, sophist we are looking at is Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus, we are still dealing with questions of ethics and morality. Hello? Nobody? The second sophist is Thrasymachus. Now we have specific problems with him. What is it? If justice is nothing but an instrument for social control, is one then justified in seeking injustice? Remember that in the Republic, in the first two, three books of the Republic, uh, Socrates is at <laughs> daggers drawn with Thrasymachus on the definition of justice. Of course, we know that epistemology is subordinated to ethics. All of that is going to run towards answering the question of what should we do? The definition of justice runs through many things and the patent of them is that uh, we have to uh, do what is good, return what we have borrowed and uh, give, give back what is due to the person. And so Socrates, Thrasymachus is asking what is the essence of justice and if it is an instrument of social control, should we then, should we then uh, praise injustice and be unjust persons? His, Theory. In the Republic, 344 C8, that's how we quote the Republic. We don't quote uh, Plato's dialogues by page number. You can get this from the, the, the dialogue entitled The Republic. The theory of Thrasymachus is simple. Justice is really the advantage of the stronger party, while injustice is profitable and advantageous to oneself. What does it mean? The laws in any state are made by the people in power, the parliamentarians whom we vote in a democracy, the uh, tyrants when they take, seize power by 
by force or the monarchs when they inherit power. They are the, well, they are the persons who make the law. And nobody can make a law to disfavor them. They make the law and they have the means of imposing the law and enforcing it. That law is made for other, other people to obey. And so it is an instrument. Justice becomes an instrument in the hands of the powerful so that they can exercise social control over the weak people. And so the argument, the Thrasymachus's argument runs thus. One, the definition of justice at that time that was invoked at that time was the respect for the law and restraint from pleonexia. Pleonexia simply means uh, the drive to gather as much wealth as possible for oneself. Corruption, bribery and all of that. Premise number two, laws are made by the powerful to be obeyed by the weak. Premise number three, people act for selfish interest. If people act for selfish interest, they cannot make laws to disfavor themselves. They make laws to favor themselves. And if those laws are made to favor themselves, therefore, justice is only the advantage of the stronger party. So I am weak today, the day I take power, I make the laws to favor me. Is that just at all? Is that kind of a justice just? That's a question. And that is what is going to strike Socrates to raise objections, many of them, many of such objections raised against uh, Thrasymachus. And the first of Socratic contentions is that Thrasymachus is deliberately narrowing down the conception of justice. At that time, in the Greek society, justice was given by the concept of dike, which had both legal and moral as well as political connotations. We have seen the political and the legal connotations what is left is the moral, which um, Thrasymachus deliberately leaves out. And what is it? Dike, dikaiosune, also means righteousness. Being the right person, doing the right thing at the right time for the right purpose. And so, we can say that to construe justice in such a narrow scope, as simply obedience to the law is dialectically implausible. It is not a means of seeking truth. So the objection, the primary objection that is raised against Thrasymachus is that he is not trying to seek truth. He is deliberately narrowing down the scope of justice in order to win a point, not to seek truth like Socrates would do. Now, if we were, so if we were Thrasymachus, how do we respond to that objection? We look at him and we say that the conception of justice which Thrasymachus gives is not that he is actually going to look for a definition of justice. He is actually looking to deconstruct the Athenian ancestral constitution. What is called in, in, in Greek studies uh, ancestral constitution is those theories that are received and preponderant in the society by mere convention. People say that it is like that and we have to accept it like it is that way. You go to my village, we eat corn fufu with the hands. You eat it with a, with a spoon, we see you as an outcast. You ask why we must eat corn fufu with, with, our, with our fingers. They say don't ask questions. It is like that. That is how it is. So, over and above the definition of justice, which is only a pretext for Thrasymachus, his goal is a philosophical critique of the unthoughtful and uncritical acceptance of social conventions without argued justification. We must give reasons why we accept things in the society the way they are. So, Tasimachus responds, say, okay, you guys say that I am, my definition of justice is narrow, good and fine, but justice is not exactly my goal. My goal is to ask you people why you think that you should accept things the way they are without question at all, especially when you pretend to be philosophers. I am the philosopher, you accept things without question. Good. The second set of uh, questions we are looking at are the epistemological questions, questions concerning knowledge. The first of them is Protagoras. We have seen his theory and argument in relativism. It can be carried over to uh, questions concerning the acquisition and validity of knowledge. That's epistemology. 
And we can say that knowledge or truth depends on each and every individual according to the relativistic principle. We don't need to go back to it. What we need to delve into is gorgeous, gorgeous, skepticism. A skeptic is a person who either doubts that there is knowledge or says that there is no knowledge whatsoever in its extreme form. And so, and Gorgias takes that kind of a stance. According to him, knowledge is not possible, neither is it communicable. We cannot know anything. Even if we knew it, we cannot communicate it. Communication is on the basis of language. And so there is a strong question of the uh, use of language, the communicating power and validity of language as a medium of communication. We shall see that. And so we formulate it as, what is the relation between words and things? When I say pen, what is it? What is the connection between that word and the object that I have in my hand? Is it a direct relationship? Is it a mediated relationship? We shall see that. So, Gorgias' theory. We are taking it from uh, Aristotle. The, there is another work of Gorgias, which, which is called the Helen, in which he elaborates that theory more, uh, uh, more consistently, but we are taking from Aristotle. His work entitled On Melissus, Xenophanes, and Gorgias, at 9798-1233. A, so we have condensed it here in a number of propositions. Three, one, nothing exists. This is a metaphysical theory of nihilism. Two, nothing is knowable. Meaning that even if something existed, we cannot know it. And we shall explain this. Knowledge is based on, knowledge of the external world, for instance, is based on perception of the senses. Okay? The senses, what I see, I only see visual perceptions. Those perceptions get into my head, they are categorized and changed into concepts that are understandable. And eventually, what I communicate is not my perceptions, my sense impressions. I communicate only the words which I have built from those perceptions. And so, from the level of knowledge, the perception, the, 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 what I have in my head is concepts, no longer the perceptions themselves. So what I know is not this pen that I have in my hand, it is a conception of the pen that I have in my hand, not the pen itself. And if I want to communicate anything about this pen, I am communicating only my conception, my understanding of it as put into words to uh, anybody who is listening to me. And that is his thesis. That is his thesis. The argument, we have tried to elaborate it already. We put it in the form of a syllogism, as usual. Knowledge is based on perceptions which are categorized into mere nomoi. Nomoi are conventions. And by, uh, according to uh, Gorgias, words are only conventional formulas. It is only a convention that the English language calls this a pen. They could call it stilo. And the Francophones have a different convention by which they call the same object. So words change. They are mere formulas that can change from time to time, from place to place, from circumstance to circumstance. Now, those formulas can also be called logoi. Logos is the, logoi is the plural of logos. And logos can be a word, it can be a statement or proposition, it can be an argument. So we use it here in a generic sense. Logoi as signifiers are mere formulas. Whereas reality is not a formula. So, if a word cannot transmit or communicate reality, because the word itself is only a formula. Meanwhile, the reality which the word is about is not a formula. It is something, it's an object hard out there, which I can perceive with my senses. So, finally, what is known is not reality. It is only the words. Only the perceptions that we get from the reality as categorized. We remember uh, in uh, uh, the process of simple apprehension, in, if, in Form 3, we were taught that we perceive things, those perceptions are worked upon by our minds and put into words. Those words are called categories. That's the process of categorization. So what if we have in our heads are categories? formulas, not the things themselves. 
And if we want to communicate anything, any knowledge, we are communicating words, not the things themselves. And so we see that if anything exists, we cannot know it because we can only know our conceptions of the things. Kant already said that there's an aspect that is knowable, another aspect that is not knowable. And if we want to communicate anything, we are going to communicate only the words that we have. That's right. So the objection we can give to uh, Gorgias is that formulas are signifiers, but they sometimes may be contiguous. That is, they may reflect the reality which they represent very, very well. We have, we have been drawing diagrams. When we draw a diagram and bring it to scale, it can be, it can be a, a, a direct, it can have a direct relationship with the things which they represent. And so, not all signifiers are mere conventions. Other words like on, on, onomatopoeia, when you say I bang the door, the bang word represents the banging sound of the door. So, words cannot be mere conventions. And so if sometimes we can communicate words, knowledge through words, that communication by, by words which are themselves contiguous with the realities they are, uh, they can transmit reality per se. They cannot fail in their transmission of reality. Now, we can respond to that objection by saying that knowledge and communication are achieved by the mediation of meaning. When I say bang the door, somehow, somewhere, if banging did not have a meaning, nobody would understand what I mean by he banged the door. So between the banging sound, my categorization of the word bang, and the understanding that somebody has, there is the meaning that is transmitted. So between the signifier, the word, the significant, what is signified, there is in between the significance, the meaning of it. And it is only the meanings that are transmitted by formulas. The meaning of something that we can understand can only be transmitted by a formula. And so reality itself can neither be known nor communicated because knowledge and communication are mediated by meaning. Of course, we can get this from uh, structuralists and from uh, Wolf, Frege, and uh, uh, other people who deal with structuralist linguistics. Now, with the sophists, we come to the question of method. Are the sophists philosophers or not? It is going to be determined by what method they use. And there are three kinds of methods that are acceptable. We have the dialectic, we have the antilogic, and we have the heuristic. What is the heuristic? Heuristic is from Greek, eris, which means strife, quarrel, contention. And heuristic as a method of argumentation, in fact, it's a cluster of methods, is actually seeking victory in argument by whatever means. If it means using a fallacy, go ahead. If it means telling the truth, go ahead. That is it. All that is sought after is to win an argument. It is used in sophistry. We can therefore see. Anti-logic is the opposition of one argument to another by contrariety or contradiction. And according to Plato, this uh, uh, technique can either be used by the sophists for sophistry, it can also be judiciously used for philosophical purposes. And of course, the method par excellence, according to Socrates and Plato, is the dialectic. In fact, the true uh, uh, conception of dialectic is floating uh, in, Arist in, in Plato and Socrates. But basically, it means a method of approaching the truth, approaching the forms in Plato. We shall see that. It's a philosophical method. And rhetoric is the art of constructing and delivering public speeches. So, Socrates himself is a rhetorician. The sophists themselves are rhetoricians insofar as they uh, construct arguments in public and they do so well. And so that uh, we come to the end of our treatment of the sophists, we now take Socrates. How do we know anything about Socrates, given that he himself did not write anything? We have four primary sources. One, from Aristophanes, entitled The Clouds, in his work entitled The Clouds. We have the next major source from Plato's dialogues, over 50 of them, 33 of them, uh, uh, deal, dealing with Socrates directly. And Xenophon, and some scattered remarks in uh, Aristotle. 
So these are the places where we can have anything that we want to know about uh, Socrates. So what is the problem about Socrates? There is a moral and there is an epistemological problem in Socrates. The first one, is there a universal standard for good and truth? Second, how can we attain good and truth? Third, how do we know the essence of anything at all? To answer these questions, we are going to take Socratic theory of uh, knowledge and Socratic morality. The first is Socratic theory of knowledge. The object is definition. Take note, please. It is not the definition as we can study in logic or have any other, any other subject given to us. It, this, it is badly translated as definition. The Greek word is orizistai. It means to set off, to mark a boundary, to bound. In fact, it is translated into Latin as determinare. So to define in such a way as to st state the essence of a thing is to set the conceptual boundaries, the limits within that which that thing can fit. It is not just to say uh, what something is. It is to state exactly what a thing is, the whatness of a thing, the nature of a thing, the exact nature of a thing, the essence of a thing. And the method is the meiotic. We shall see that the meiotic is only a metaphor for the, the way Socrates proceeds in the attainment of knowledge. Now, definition as the essence of things. Socrates seeks after definitions. And in order to understand what it means about, Socrates says that the thought of a thing has two aspects in it. The particular thing that I am looking at and the concept or the exemplar, the notion of that thing that I have in my head. I look at a tree, I recognize it as a tree. I look at another thing, I know that it's a tree. Because what I see in the second place corresponds to that exemplar, that notion, that concept that I, I abstracted from the first object that I saw. That is how I can be able to call it a tree. So the exemplar is what is knowable, it is the universal. It is what makes the thing what it is. It is the treeness in my head that makes me recognize this object as a tree because I already have it in my head. It is what gives that tree its being. The particular is perceptible, the exemplar is in my head, it is not perceptible. So the exemplar determines the nature and the definition of a thing. So that a definition in the sense of orizistai means that we can substitute, substitute the definience and the definendum in such a way as to save the truth without loss of any element at all. In your study of definitions, you learned that definitions have to be adequate. This is it. Substitutivity salva veritate. Uh, we have to substitute the uh, definience and the definendum. Each one can take the place of the other. Such that the is is not only a copula, it becomes an existential and an identity is in the definition. The method, Socratic method, is the meiotic. Meiotic is the uh, metaphor for a, bon, intellectual midwifery. The job of a midwife is to deliver a pregnant woman of knowledge. So Socrates basically says that the people who come to him are not totally ignorant. They have knowledge in themselves. And what we are going to do is to help them bring forth the knowledge that they have in themselves. And the basic presupposition is that the interlocutor, the one who Socrates is talking with, has innate knowledge, is pregnant with knowledge. He has knowledge in themselves. Nobody can teach them anything. We can only help them deliver, bring forth the knowledge that they have. What are the elements of the meiotic? They are one, irony. I know that I don't know. For any conversation to take place at all, somebody must be ignorant of something. That is what makes it possible for somebody to tell someone something. If we all knew the same things, nobody would tell anything, anything to anybody. And conversations would be practically impossible. So the role of Socratic irony is to trigger the dialectic, the conversation. The elenchus is the logical refut refutation. Once the interlocutor has said what they have to say, Socrates will then go forth to question it point by point to see whether such a position is arguable, acceptable or not. And this technique presupposes that if you have an idea of something, then you must have a fully developed conception of it. 
somebody who is honest must know what honesty is all about. If we take the Yutifro dilemma, for instance, Yutifro is going to, to report his father for impiety. So Socrates asks him, what is piety and what is impiety? You are going to report your father for doing wrong things. What is the wrong thing? And the, and the, the argument goes on. Now, we can piece it together, putting things together. The dialectic as a whole is the umbrella within which the meiotic takes place. So, meiotic is constituted of irony and the elenchus, which are found in the dialectic. And the dialectic is the method for a priori inquiry. It can only serve the purposes of arguments which do not depend upon experience. Things like syllogisms are a priori. It depends upon stated principles, and we can go on to deduce the other uh, 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 values from them. It is not suited for a posteriori, which we need to gain from experience and contact with things. Good. Now, the objection we can give to Socrates is simple. You say that possession breeds awareness, but we know that possession does not always breed awareness. To possess a certain quality does not necessarily mean that we have a fully developed conception of it. A madman does not know what psychoanalysis says about madness. He possesses madness, but he cannot tell us what madness is all about. Honest persons cannot tell us what honesty is about. They are simply honest. So, possession does not always breed awareness, as Socrates thinks from his Carmides dialogue. Now, if we were Socrates, how do we respond? Socrates says that possession entails endowment with the requisite resources to attain definition. The background of this is the metempsychosis. Before incarnation, the souls contemplated the uh, forms and knew the forms. At the moment of incarnation, the souls forgot. So, if we are honest, in, for instance, it means that we have an idea of what honesty is and we can be brought by the special and requisite intellectual effort to produce a detailed account of honesty, for instance. Because we knew it before our souls came into the bodies and the coming into the bodies of our souls made us forget. So, it is still possible with the requisite effort of remembration, remembering, then we can come by a priori inquiry to know and to produce a fully developed conception of what we are, or what we possess, what we are conversant with. Now, Socratic morality, that we are done with Socratic epistemology and a bit of metaphysics, we come to Socratic morality. The ultimate goal of Socratic morality, the reason why people do whatever that they do, whenever that they do it, is happiness, eudaimonia. In fact, it is translated as happiness, but it's a concept that is quite, uh, quite fluid in Greek. Now, how do we attain happiness, eudaimonia, according to Socrates? There is a cluster of concepts which we have to understand. One is arete, what, what we translate as virtue or excellence. But in fact, for the Greek conception, it is simply the qualities that enable the performance of a characteristic activity the special function of anything. The special function of a pen is to make legible marks. So the qualities that make a pen make legible mark is the virtue or the arity of that pen. Now, the ergon, we, they don't translate it into English, the ergon is the function itself, the special function. The writing of the pen, sorry, the, the, the marks made by the pen is the function of the pen. The qualities it has to make those legible marks are the arete. And now, a good pen, the agathos pen, is a pen that performs its function well. So this is the theory that Socrates is going to have to apply on the human being to see. And the question then becomes, in the human being, what is arete? Arete is the capacity for the human being to be what makes him distinctively human apart from plants and animals. And what is that quality? It is, of course, reason, intellect. Now, the human ergon, that special function that a human being has to do is reasoning. And so, the goal and the good of the human being is happiness. A person is happy when he has the endowment or the qualities 
to perform the, fun the, 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 the function of reasoning, only such a person can be a happy person. A madman who has lost the functions, the quality of reasoning well, cannot be happy in the Socratic sense, according to that conception. And that's the theory. The theory of Socrates is that knowledge is virtue. It can be interpreted in two ways, by a straightforward interpretation, that to know the good is to do the good. But we also have the deeper interpretation, which says that to know as a human being is to perform your function as a human being. The arete of the human being is that special endowment, that special capacity to understand things, to reason well. And so, if we fail in the knowledge, it means that what, whenever we do not know something well, it is going to lead us into error, into making mistakes. So wrongdoing is a failure in knowing what makes the soul as good as possible. What makes the soul happy? So ignorance is vice. The vice here is the unhappiness which is going to lead us into. That's the theory. Now, the objection. How, how can we counter uh, Socrates? Everybody is our experience that knowledge of the good does not always entail doing good. St. Paul, in the letter to the Romans, for instance, already says it. The good that I know and I want to do, I don't do it. The evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. That is St. Paul. And that's a good example of this objection to Socrates. We know that we, we fix goals, we work out means to achieve them, but sometimes we act in ways that do not uh, uh, favor the attainment of our goals. In philosophy, we call it moral acrasia. Acrasia means our will is weak, and we get that from the Protagoras. We respond to it. Socrates responds to it by saying that acrasia results from wrong description of true motives of action. We cannot say that our will is weak. If we say that our will is weak, it is not because we wanted to do something that we did not do. It is because we actually saw that what we were doing did not serve our interest. We work for hedonic purposes all the time, all the time. And so, each time that something is to our interest, we shall do it. We shall not then do it and come back to say that it is the will, the will that was weak. No, it is because we pursued the interest that was more pleasurable, more acceptable to us at that time. That is why. That is why uh, Socrates says that there is nothing like acrasia. Acrasia is a misestimation, a miscalculation, a misrepresentation of the uh, real motives of people. Now, dear students and colleagues, we have come to the, the end of the expose. We have questions to answer. You are going to have to underline the correct answer. We shall give you time to answer. Hmm? Question number one. The Sophists and Socrates initiated a shift in the history of philosophy from A. The search for knowledge to, to money. B. Cosmology to moral philosophy. C. Cosmocentric inquiry to anthropocentric inquiry. D. Cosmology to man and the society. Answer, please. Somebody has an answer? If there's no answer... Hey, Rudolph, can you give us an answer, please? Serena, I can see you there. Can you give us an answer? We have options. A, B, C, D. Nobody's on? The question. The Sophist and Socrates initiated a shift in the history of philosophy from what to what? We can't hear you. All right. Well, we cannot hear you very well. The answer is C. It was the inquiry from cosmocentric to anthropocentric uh, type of investigations. Hmm? Voila. Question number two. Which of these argument techniques disqualify the sophists as philosophers? Which of these argument techniques disqualify the sophists as philosophers? A. The use of rhetoric 
with their students. B, the use of heuristic with their audience. C, the use of antilogic with their audience. D, the use of dialectic with their audience. Anybody there? Gloria, are you on? Nobody? We don't have a return. We said, of course, that heuristic is the technique of winning an argument by whatever means. Socratic method is to seek truth by the method of dialectic. The sophists, the sophists are the people who use any possible means with heuristic. So the answer is B. It is this technique of argumentation, the heuristic, that disqualifies the uh, sophists as philosophers. Your microphones are not active. That is why we cannot hear you from this end. Click on the microphones. They should be active. You see the microphone is red with a red bar in it, on it, it means that it is not active. So you have to click on it to make it active. Voila. Question number three. Question number three. Why is Protagorean relativism not self-contradictory? Why is Protagorean relativism not self-contradictory? A. Opinions are self-referential. B. Opinions refer to the same object. C. Subject and object of relative assertions are the same. D. Same subjects but different objects. What is the correct option, please? I can see uh, microphones are still not active. Subject and object or relative assertions are the same? Oh, that is not a correct answer, please. The options are A, opinions are self-referential. B, opinions refer to the same object. C, subject and object of relative assertions are the same. D, same subject, different objects. The subject and the object cannot be the same because it is different people talking even if they are talking about the same thing. Contradiction requires that the subject and the object have to be the same. But in relativism, the subjects differ even if they are talking about the same object. You and I are talking about this room. It is hot for me but cold for you. And so the correct answer would be A. The opinions are self-referential. Yes, the opinions are self-referential. That's the correct answer. That is why uh, Protagorean relativism is not self-contradictory. Voilà. Quest Question number four. Azangwim Serena, your, micro your microphone is still not active. What is, the moral what is the moral and epistemological implication of the man-measure thesis of Protagoras? the moral and epistemological implication of the man-measure thesis of Protagoras. Remember, you said that man is the measure of all things. A, relativism. B, ah, okay, correct. Somebody has got it correct. Thank you very much there. It is relativism. That's good. Correct answer. Good. Next question. Why is the communication of knowledge impossible for Gorgias? Why is the communication of knowledge impossible for Gorgias? A. Words are mere conventions. B. Words only express thoughts, not sense impressions. C. Words are meaningless. D. Words have a direct relationship with things. Words only express thoughts and not sense impressions. Knowledge comes from sense impressions. A is quite a distractor. Uh, we don't have time to explain that. 
A is a very good destructor. You got it correct. So the answer is B. Words only express thoughts and not. There is an echo, please. We have got the answer. Words only express thoughts, not self impressions. Question number six. What is the aim of Thrasymachus' praise of injustice? What is the aim of Thrasymachus' praise of injustice? A. An heuristic attempt to discredit Socrates. B. A dialogical attempt to discredit Socrates. C. A dialectical attempt to discredit Socrates. D. A deconstruction of the Athenian ancestral constitution. D, correct. D is the correct answer. That is right. So the aim of Thrasymachus is to deconstruct the Athenian constitution, to criticize convention that people accept without criticism. Okay, question number seven. Which of these is false of the sophists as authentic philosophers? Which of these is false of the sophists as authentic philosophers? A. They questioned man and the society. B. They developed subjectivism. C. They possessed wisdom. D. They developed nihilism. B. B. They developed subjectivism. Remember Protagoras. Sorry? Is false, discredits them, discredits them as philosophers. What? D is not correct. Gorgeous. Who is talking, please? Many people are talking at the same time, we cannot hear you well. D. D is not correct. Re remember that Gorgia said that nothing exists. That is a nihilist theory. Katia, it is not D. The correct answer is C. A false philosopher is one who possesses wisdom. A true philosopher is one who seeks wisdom, but does not possess it yet. He is always searching for it. He doesn't possess it. So anybody who claims to possess it, is a fake. And that's why sophists can be called fake. Okay. Question number eight. What does the Socratic dictum, according to which the only thing that he knows is that he knows nothing? What does it express? A. His moral intellectualism. B. His humility. C. His irony. D. His midwifery. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. What is that? Your microphones are inactive. C, irony. Correct. Who answered? That's, that's Katia. That is Katia. C is the correct answer. There is noise. There's an echo. Question nine. What is the object, what is the object of Socratic epistemology? What is the object of... Socratic epistemology. <laughs> if you want to talk elsewhere, you turn off your mic. What is the object of Socratic epistemology? A. The particular aspects of a thing. B. The nature of a thing. C. The appearance of a thing. D. The thing as perceived. The object of Socratic epistemology. What does he seek about anything? What is the answer? Sorry? B, the nature of a thing. Correct. The nature of a thing. The nature of a thing. The essence of a thing. What makes the thing what it is? The exemplar. The definition. Question number 10. What is the source of evil to Socrates? What is the source of evil? Wrongdoing. What is it? A, abuse of the will. B, Misuse of human free will. C. Ignorance. D. The evil demon. C. Ignorance. Correct. 
C, the correct answer is C, ignorance. Very good. And that was the last of the uh, questions uh, for your assignment. Trace, there is something wrong with your microphone. Trace, your microphone is not, is not active. That's why we cannot hear you. That is right. So, uh, dear students, we are drawing to the close of this uh, presentation. And uh, we are going to give you a little assignment. Question Is Socratic epistemology convincing? Is Socratic epistemology convincing? 25 marks. Remember that you are writing a full essay. The introduction, 5 marks. Thesis, 7 marks. The antithesis, which we call objections, 6 marks. The synthesis, four marks, and the conclusion, three marks. You are to construct a philosophical essay for that question. Before we go on, before we go on, uh, I'll stop here to ask, to ask if you have any questions of your own. We did not have any break. We did not have any break during the lesson. People did not ask questions. So now is your time to ask questions, beginning from the pre-Socratics all the way down to Socrates that we have treated today. The next lesson we shall be doing will be on Plato and um, uh, Aristotle. So we are taking from the pre-Socratics all the way down to Socrates today. So questions. Other questions? Tracy, your microphone is not active, so you have to tap it and make it active. Serena, your microphone is not active. Sorry? It is active, okay. Ngum. Ngum Precious, can we hear you? Ngum Precious, can we hear you? Trace, are you asking a question? There's an echo, I cannot hear you well. Okay, if you don't have questions, I will ask my own questions then. And I'm going to ask you Tracy directly. Tracy, be ready to answer this question. Are you talking? Tracy, were you asking a question? Your microphone is not active. Your microphone is not active. Seren Chang, is there a question? Okay, I'll ask my own question. I will ask my own question. Why? Who is talking? Somebody tell us what Anaximedes' chief philosophical insight is all about. Can somebody tell us? In Anaximedes, who says that the arche, the originating principle, is air? What is the philosophical insight, the philosophical point that Anaximedes makes with his air uh, theory?
Tracy? Tracy, we're not getting you. You see that all things are created from air. Tracy, you use a very interesting word there. You said all things are created from air. How did the word creation get into Anaximenes? No, creation is, uh, is in church. Hmm? Anaximenes is talking about origination. How things come out of air. How they come to be into which they perish. There you are right. Now the question is, no, that is, that is the, the physical, empirical description of it. In all of that empirical description, what is the philosophical point that he is making? And how can you uh, try to prove it to? What evidence do we have today that can prove that Anaximenes' point was correct? You're thinking, okay, Sir Inno, Sir Innocent, are you are you with us? Your microphone is not active. Your microphone is not active, Sir Innocent. Put your, put your microphone active. I can see uh, Chief Lanka. Okay. I can see Fabian. Fabian, the question is on. The question is on. What is... We acknowledge, we acknowledge your presence and we're asking a question. What is Anaximenes' chief philosophical point and how can we justify what evidence we have today to buttress it? All right. If there is no answer, maybe we take this point down. Of what Anaximenes said, the empirical description is okay, very scientific, but the philosophy in it is simple. Simple. And what is it? That differences in quantity, that is the quantity of air, result in differences in quality. That is the differences in the kinds of things we have in the universe. That is the point. I repeat. Differences in quantity result in differences in quality what does that mean it means that when we have different volumes or quantities of air it gives rise to the different kinds of things we see in the universe animals trees stones plants the evidence we have today to buttress this point is very clear one a man and a horse are all made of flesh and blood and bones but the difference between a man and a horse is a difference in the quantity, the number of chromosomes in each cell. Horse cells, dog cells, human cells have chromosomes. They have the same organelles, but there's a difference. The number, the quantity of the chromosomes in the cells. That is one key point which makes a horse a different kind of a thing, a dog a different kind of a thing, and, a, and a, a man a different kind of a thing. Next, evidence. The difference between aluminum and copper, all made of atoms, what is it? It is a difference in the number of protons and neutrons in their nuclei. They all have electrons. They all have electrons. And the difference is in the number of something. So there's a difference in quantity there 
that leads to a difference in the nature, a difference in the kind of thing, a difference in quality, the kinds of things that we have. Very good. Okay, our time is running out, dear students. We are going to try to make a brief summary of the sophists and of Socrates. One, we know that the sophists and Socrates inaugurated a different kind of questioning in the landscape of philosophy, transiting from the cosmological and metaphysical investigations of the pre-Socratics. What they did, Socrates and the sophists, was to change the object of philosophy, to make philosophy questioning no longer the universe as a whole, but human beings, their ways of acting in society, their interactions with one another. So we say that they inaugurated a paradigm shift from cosmocentrism to anthropocentrism. And that the sophists as a whole, we can understand them as philosophers insofar as they raise philosophical questions. The questions we have treated here, questions with gorgeous of uh, skepticism, questions with Protagoras of relativism, questions of justice. These are questions that philosophers continue to grapple with all the way till today and continues in the future. But the difference is that sometimes the sophists did not raise these questions for the sake of intellectual growth, for the sake of the search for truth. What they did was to discuss these questions for the sake of winning arguments by whatever method was available at their disposal. And that is what we call the technique of heuristic. That is what makes them what reduces their philosophical quality. Because they win arguments, if it means taking a fallacy, okay, fine. We use a fallacy. If it means using emotive language, fine. If, if it means speaking the truth, fine. It is an heuristic method. And that the method par excellence for uh, philosophy is the dialectic as so Socrates. And eventually Plato would propound. Now, Socrates, Socrates for his part, is always in contradiction with the sophists for reasons we have tried to explain and his moral he believes basically that there is a universal moral norm binding to everybody everywhere at any time if we say that it is wrong to kill then nobody anywhere should be allowed to kill for whatever purpose although somebody like Prot protagoras would say that if it is good to kill here fine if it is good not to kill there fine and nobody has the right to impose anything on anybody. Also, that knowledge, truth, is universal. There is one absolute truth to which everybody must tend, that is Socrates, but for uh, the sophists like Protagoras, truth is relative. What is true is true according to you. What is true is true according to me. And I have no right to impose whatever I, can, I have to impose on you. And this, the, um, the implication is that nobody can reform any moral laws anywhere. Things have to be the way they have been till the way they shall be. You cannot change anything if things are relative. That is the uh, political and ethical consequence of Protagorean relativism. Okay. Socrates in epistemology seeks the nature or the essence of something. Not the definition as you can rattle off definitions, but the kind of definition which would state the nature the kind of definition in which the definience and the definendum can be replaced one for the other, such that there is no loss of any information at all. When we say that man is a rational animal, in any sentence in which man appears, we should be able to replace rational animal and lose no information at all. That is what we described as substitutivity salva veritate. That is it. And that is what it means. It means, therefore, that in the, that kind of essential definition, the is, man is a rational animal. The is is not copulative. It is not even veridical. It is rather identical. There are four meanings of is. It can be copulative, can be veridical, speaking the truth. It can be existential, meaning that something exists. 
we can say that man is. It means man exists, and it can be also an is of identity. So this is the is that Socrates uses in his definitions. And that is the kind of is that is used in your definitions you treat in logic, and that's why we say that it's the principle of identity, the principle of identity that validates all definitions insofar as they are correct definitions in logic. Okay, Socrates uh, has told us what he has told us, and now we can close our lesson. Dear students, taking the appointment to meet again on Thursday at the same time when we shall be dealing with Plato and Aristotle. When you come on that day, be ready. There's going to be a lot of metaphysics in the air, the theory of the forms and all of that. And remember your assignment. Remember your assignment is Socrates epistemology convincing you are developing an essay for 25 marks. There will be lots of things. Metaphysics with Aristotle, metaphysics with Plato, epistemology with Plato, morality with Plato, morality with, with Aristotle. It is going to be heavy. So take care of yourselves and come on time ready for the lesson. Una tege si matege yop, una tege minga matege nyum, una tege majang matege ndom, mane tambia niña ne injubiayen, gani bana matege mot, gani la kiri watege ndom, esetina bia dinkido, mane tambia niña ne injubiayen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia niña ne injo biayen